You know, one thing that really stands out to me about Urasayatsu is the characters. Not only do you got all the weird humans there, but once the aliens get involved, it gets really crazy. In the second part of my Urasayatsu series, we're going to take a look at all these unique personalities that make Urasayatsu what it is. You're going to be surprised how deep some of these characters are. I mean, a lot of people seem to write the show off as having only one or two jokes, but some of these characters are surprisingly complex. We're going to see that. But before we get started, if you're new around here, I suggest you take a look at my previous video where I go over some basic background information about the series and how it all got started back in 78. To those who've given me feedback on that, thanks, I really appreciate it. In this video, I've tried to go for a much more conversational tone because the previous time I was just reading a script and obviously that's a little soulless, so I hope you appreciate the changes I made. With that out of the way, let's get started. When it comes to the cast, there's no better place to start than with our hero, Ataro Moroboshi. Now, people just getting into the series tend to hate this guy, and it's easy to see why. I mean, he's lazy, a total pervert, and overall a total prick. You wonder how anyone even hangs out with the guy. To be honest though, he's always kind of had the cards stacked against him. I mean, right from the beginning, he was born on one of the most unlucky days even imaginable. And in this world, luck is very real. So he's kind of always had to deal with all this random crap happening in his life. Growing up, he was a weird kid. But an important distinction of his character is the fact that while he was a weird kid and a weird guy, he's not a bad guy. Now of course, he doesn't respect people's personal space, and his actions are pretty unlikable most of the time. But what separates him from just being written off as a horny teenager is the fact that he's got a lot of tenacity. I mean, he really never gives up on almost anything he tries to do. And it's very rare you're actually going to see him feel dejected or depressed unless he's particularly emotional about something. It's hard not to respect the fact that even though he's been rejected day after day, he's able to pick himself back up and keep going at it. In fact, he probably enjoys it. This is why, while most of the characters kind of hate him, they also like to keep him around, just because of how entertaining he is. Plus, there's a few key moments through the series where you see that he's got a big heart. He's actually quite emotional when he wants to be, and it's really nice to see that because it helps you realize that he's a three-dimensional character even if he lives in a place that operates on Looney Tunes physics. But the truth is, he doesn't want to be seen as a smart, emotional guy. He wants to be seen as a suave, cool guy. And honestly, can you blame him? I think we all want to be seen as that at some point. In this series, Atara was voiced by Toshio Furukawa, who honestly does an amazing job with him. I miss Wesson I was able to switch his voice on a dime. <laughs> For being endearing, honest, and overall entertaining, Ataru is certifiably based. So keep on posting those more brochures. Shinobu is a character that kind of got lost in the transition from Urasayatsu being a really short series to a much longer one. Initially, she was Taro's girlfriend, and you can see how she was a sweet girl, but she was impulsive, and for a good reason. She always had to put up with Taro's behavior, but she always was convinced he would change. But once Lum came along, Shinobu got very jealous, and very upset a lot of times. But this jealousy gave her new powers, including her incredible strength. Any day of the week, you can see this girl throwing desks around like it's nothing. It's quite amazing. But once Chitaro came into the scene, she kind of gained a new position as a voice of reason among the cast. This may be because out of all the main cast, she has the most grounded background. She wasn't rich or directly involved with the aliens at the beginning. She was just doing her own thing. Now she's kind of stuck in all this drama. An important moment of her character growth is when she formally gives up on Ataru, which can be seen in episode 44, After You've Gone, probably one of the best episodes in the entire series. It's pretty touching to see how even though Shinobu and Ataru have their differences, they're still friends at the end of the day. Anyway, she wanted to be with Chitaro for a while, but that didn't end up working out because, as we're going to find out, he's not much different from Moroboshi himself. While her character isn't entirely defined by her relationships, the fact that she's had such bad luck with Ben gives her an interesting perspective. Near the latter half of the series, her character gets reinvigorated with the introduction of Kitsune, a charming little fox who always hooks up to her. But anyways, Shinobu's just a really nice character to have in the series. Honestly, I can't blame people who say first girl best girl. While she's not my favorite, she's definitely number two. 
She may hate men sometimes, but they're responsible for their actions. So if you ever see Shinobu appreciation thread, bump it. It's a good idea. By the way, Shinobu is often seen as Rumiko's self-insert, and I can see why. But that doesn't take away from the fact that she is still an entertaining character. Shinobu is voiced by Seiko Shimazu, who is able to give Shinobu both her very soft voice, as well as her extremely angry voice. And I just enjoy to see how they blend together. Mama is arguably one of the most popular anime characters of all time, and especially of the 80s. By the way, it's not Lum Invader, it's just Lum. Don't read Wikipedia. Lum's character changes dramatically throughout the early series. Initially, she was a one-off antagonist, because back when Urusei Atsu was just getting started, Rumiko planned to make it only around 5 or 10 chapters long, with each chapter focusing on Ataro and Shinobu dealing with another weird thing. Even in the second chapter, Lum's not even present. Arguably the peak of what I like to call Evil Lum can be seen in Chapter 5. I mean Lum weirdly tries to kill Ataro because of what he's doing. So, not someone you'd expect to root for, but as it turns out, the readers of the series really liked her. Now before I go further, I just want to dispel this bait that's been spread for ages, about how the shift in Lum's character was due to the editors of Weekly Show on Sunday forcing Rumiko to change Lum's character because people liked her so much. It's pretty easy to disprove this with just a little bit of research and basic thought. Now of course, her initial plan for the series was different, but don't you think for her first big manga that she would actually listen to the editors and the fan feedback and try to shift the character to what fans liked? I mean, she's not stupid. So when the character started to shift a little bit, this can be seen much more apparently in the anime because that started after Lum's character already transitioned. This can be especially seen in the manga exclusive chapter Love and Suffering, which shows how Lum is trying to do her best to actually be nice to Ataru. But of course, Ataro, being his usual self, just really pisses her off, and for all the right reasons. It's not vindictive like the earlier chapters, because you kind of feel bad for her. This is a running theme throughout the series, but we're going to see that Ataro actually really likes one when she goes out of her way to dress like an Earth Girl. And this leads perfectly into the next chapter, How I've Waited For You, or as fans of the anime know, Pitter Patter Christmas Eve. I'm going to go over this more in my video on my favorite stories throughout the manga, but this chapter is just excellent, and it shows how endearing Lum actually is by this point in the series. So Lum, after being on Earth for a while, eventually transfers to Ataru's high school, and is generally just a really nice person. Of course, a lot of her quirks come from the fact that even though she's fairly smart, she's still a foreigner living on an entirely different planet. Of course, she can understand the language, but she's pretty naive. I mean, just look at how she interpreted the marriage proposal. An important thing to know about her character, in the manga, her hair is iridescent, looks kinda like a prism, but in the anime, they've actually changed it to green, which matches Ten's hair. Because on a TV budget, iridescent hair was a no-go. Now, I just have to mention the reboot, which by the way, I'm barely mentioning in this because this is about the original series, not the reboot. But in the reboot, I do like how they have her hair be kind of a mix of the manga and anime styles. It's really nice. Anyways, her green-haired look is probably the one most recognizable to people. Now, a few of Lum's abilities. Like the rest of her family, she can fly, which is really shocking at first, but is actually pretty funny. Because she's actually surprisingly weak without her ability to fly, because she doesn't work her muscles as much. And of course, her infamous ability is shoot lightning. It's been said that Lum's lightning ability is sort of impulsive, and how she does adjust when her emotions are very strong. It's really nice. And you can see her constantly use these abilities whenever people, or of course, Ataru upsets her. I think what really gravitates people towards Lum is the fact that she's, like Ataru, a very endearing character, but in a very different way. While Ataru never tries to give up on trying to chase as many girls as possible, Lum never gives up on trying to stand by Ataru. Some people may think she's just stubborn, but I think she just knows Ataru's true nature and how he's a really nice guy. She knows that if he actually tried, he could be really nice to her. By the way, even though I keep referring to him as Ataru, she's always calling him darling. I can count off the top of my head exactly one time she doesn't call him Darwin. And you can always appreciate a good pet name, can't you? Lum scouted her more dedicated fans throughout the school, and with her liberating sense of dress and her vocal tics, it's easy to see why Lum really owned the 80s. Also, Lum has her own UFO parked in the sky all the time, but she prefers living with the Maraboshis, even sleeping in Ataru's closet because he insists, of course, they don't sleep in the same bed. 
I always found this pretty funny after learning that Rumiko herself used to sleep in the closet when she was writing the initial chapters of Ursa Yatsura with her assistants. Lum might not be my favorite, but I can see why she's everyone else's. By the way, these days Lum is associated with quite a few other things. Of course, Future Funk, which, you know, it's alright, I think artsy stuff is pretty decent. But even more interesting is how she's viewed in the stock market. Probably because of that green hair, but Lum posting is a great way to improve your portfolio. Especially if you buy semiconductors and the ETF Soxel. Now it doesn't always work out, but people believe in Lum for their stocks, and I can see why. So if you want to make it, try Lum posting. Shotaro Mendo was the character who really shook up the initial dynamic of Ursa Yatsura. The guy is rich and he knows it. He's introduced right when Ataru, Lum, and Shinobu are another one of their arguments that happens pretty much every day. Wanting to show off immediately, he's airdropped from one of his family's heavy bombers, and immediately butts heads with Ataru, and we can see why. The values Mendo prides himself on are pretty much the exact opposite of how Ataru acts. While Ataru dresses casually, swacks off in school, and is, well, poor, Mendo works hard in school, dresses very nicely, and he's rich. Naturally, Mendo sees Ataru as pretty much common or scum. This extends pretty much to every other guy in Tomobiki High. The funny thing, of course, is that Mendo is actually just like Ataru in a lot of ways. He's actually a pretty big womanizer too. And while the girls generally like him, he's not about them. He only cares for Lum. And of course, even though he has all the resources in the world, he's never gonna get Lum, but he's not gonna stop trying. Now, right when he's introduced, the first thing that happens to him is Shinobu's desk hits him. Of course, Shinobu follows her instantly, but he doesn't really care about her that much. His old samurai values, while seeming like a virtue, honestly hold him back in a lot of ways. I mean, one of his biggest faults is his pride. Of course, one of the classic sins. If you get him mad, he's gonna try to kill you with his katana. He never succeeds, of course, but he's really irritable in that sense. And of course, he's got some pretty funny character quirks. The guy's got claustrophobia and he's scared of the dark, so if you ever put him in a bell or any other dark enclosed space, he's gonna freak out. With one exception, of course. The woman's looking at him, he's fine. It's that ego of his. He often uses his family's resources to help him out. Whether that be deliver a bunch of food, give him a bunch of money, or just straight up try to kill Ataru. He may have all the resources in the world, but he's still subject to the same wacky logic the rest of the world is. Over the course of the series, we can see that he gets some subtle character growth, but he's not really a good guy for most of it. Unlike Ataru, who's blatantly honest about how he is, Mendo is a lot more slimy. But while I might not be the biggest fan of Mendo, I can see why others are. He's funny. Unintentionally, of course. By the way, Ataru and him have kind of an interesting relationship, we'll say. As we're gonna see, the rest of his family is kind of crazy as well, so you understand why he's the way he is. Overall, he's a great counter to Ataru. Mendo is voiced by Akira Kamiya, who is able to pull off his very serious formal tones, as well as his crazy yells. A lot of fun to listen to. While you might not root for him, it's always fun to see whatever he's up to. That's the main cast of Ursa Yatsura. These four characters have a dynamic similar to that of, honestly, Archie. I mean, you got a typical teenager, the rich kid, the childhood friend, and the popular girl. While it's never been outright confirmed, there is a lot of speculation that the rampant piracy of Archie comics in the late 70s sort of inspired Rumiko to create this dynamic. And it's a classic dynamic, I can see why she brought it in. A lot of times when there's a story where it's not actually set in Tomobiki or the school, you're gonna see these four characters travel around and do a bunch of wacky adventures together. With the core cast out of the way, let's look at some of the other characters. In a few words, Ten's a good boy. He's Wom's cousin, son of a firefighter, who came to Earth to check out what Wom was doing after she got married, apparently. And guess what? He butts heads with Ataru immediately. That happens a lot. It's because of how Ten saw Ataru act towards Wom, he wants to make sure that Wom is being treated well. Ten acts kind of like Ataru in Mendo, which is a little weird because he's a baby. He's able to use his childlike appearance to get a lot closer to the woman than Ataru ever could. Like Guam, Ten can fly, but his ability is to breathe fire, which he uses constantly. 
In many episodes of the series, you're going to see Ten try to flame Ataro and he's going to defend himself with a frying pan. They go about this back and forth constantly, and you often see Ataro and Ten compete for women, notable example being the flower shop girl. But Ten pretty much never associates with kids his own age. His biggest crush in the series is Sakura, who we're going to explore later. It's funny, of course, because she's one of the most mature women in the series. Ten's hair in the manga was always green, and it's where Wam got her hair color from. The truth is, Ten and Ataro, they're almost like brothers if you didn't know their origins. But like any pair of brothers, they're both gonna deny it if you ask him about it. By the way, if you ever see characters call him Jara Ten, that's basically them making fun of him. It's kinda like calling someone a brat. If you ever see Ten buzzing around, prepare for trouble. Yunosuke Fujinami is a character that I'm actually going to make a whole video about at some point. Her character is that deep, but for now I'm going to give a short overview of her. She was probably the latest addition to the main cast of the series, showing up about a little under halfway through the manga. The thing about her situation is that it feels a little more grounded than the rest of the cast. Yunosuke's mother seems to have died early on in her life, so she was raised almost entirely by her father. Who by the way is the worst character in the series, I think everyone agrees on that. But anyways, he always wanted a son, and even though Ryunosuke was a girl, he raised her like a son. As a result, Ryunosuke has got a very stereotypically masculine aura to her. She talks like a man, dresses like a man, even fights like a man. But what does she hate most? Being called a man. The thing that's admirable about her character is the fact that she never gives up on standing up to her dad. He can try to beat her up all he wants, but she'll punch right back. Her story intersects with everyone else's when the main cast visits her family's shop on the beach. When they inadvertently wreck the family shop, they all move to Tomobiki, and they now live in Tomobiki High's student shop. The thing that's funny about Rinosuke, of course, is the fact that she's honestly the best guy in the series. While pretty much every other guy in the school, especially Ataro and Mendo, try way too hard to be cool, Rinosuke is just naturally cool, and the girls really appreciate that. She can tell them she's a girl, but they don't even care. The guys in the school actually generally treat her as a girl. Now, of course, this means for Ataro that he's going to treat her kind of like crap a lot of the time, but he's actually surprisingly heartfelt towards her, probably because he cares so much about her being seen as a woman. The weird thing, of course, is that the rest of the world doesn't really treat her as a girl. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into her relationships with other characters because that's what the separate video is going to be about, but Rinosuke's relationships with other girls is really surprising and pretty remarkably deep for a series of this type. Now just to be clear, I'm a straight guy, so I can't relate to this personally, but it can be interpreted that Rinosuke is bisexual or lesbian, and we can see with her relationships with other girls that, yeah, you can see it that way. I'm not going to dwell too deeply on that for now, but just know that Rinosuke is actually surprisingly relatable for a lot of people. She may be a dark horse pick for the best girl, but she's up there for me, and I can appreciate that. So to all you Ryu fans, I applaud you. Sakura is a mystical yet modern woman. She's a Shinto priestess, and so she's able to get a lot of powers from that. She's very good at controlling spirits and other oddities in the world. The thing is, she looks nothing like her uncle Cherry, so a person looking at them for the first time wouldn't even think they're related. And while being a priestess has its perks, she also needs to get a job, so she works as Tomobiki High's nurse. But of course that means she's always got to deal with a bunch of high school guys hitting on her, and she's got zero tolerance, even less than most of the other characters. She finds it quite literally insulting, the fact that they had purposely hurt themselves to waste her time. The thing about Sakura is that she has a very mature vibe to her. She talks in a very old fashioned way and she's very authoritative in the way she speaks. Now one of her interesting quirks is the fact that she can eat pretty much all the food she wants and she's never going to gain weight. This is one of the ways you can see how she's related to Cherry, it seems their whole family has immense appetite. Now, when she was a child, she was kind of weak for a long time because she got a lot of bad spirits and illnesses within her. But when she met Ataro, she was able to transfer all of that to him, so while she's fine, he's got even more bad luck than ever. Sakura fans are pretty cool, and I can see why. She stands out from the rest of the cast just because of how mature she is. Sakura was voiced by Machiko Washio, who expertly does her chanting. as well as her just generally mature vibe. Yeah! 
Sakram Bro, or as he likes to be called, Cherry is the resident old guy of the series. He's a travel monk who likes to show up whenever you want it or not. Pretty much everyone in the show kind of hates the guy because he's just always there. He's always judging others and telling other people they're going to have a bad time if they don't listen to him. And he's always cracking the dumbest jokes ever. Cherry has a pretty carefree life and you often see him living outside in a tent. He's a monk so he's actually pretty smart, similar to Sakura. But the fact that he's a snob and always looking for a free meal means that people don't really like to deal with him. So if you ever find yourself with Cherry, just give him some food and tell him to move on already. His voice actor is a Chiro Nagai who always plays these old guys. He may be a monk, but he doesn't act like one. Mom's Stormtroopers are a group of four guys who've been friends since childhood. You got Kakugari, the large guy, Chibi, the small guy, Perm, who's got puffy hair, and their self proclaimed leader, Megane. In the manga, these characters were fairly minor, only appearing in some early chapters. But the thing is, the manga and anime kind of took a different direction on these characters. In the manga, you got a character called Kosuke, who's basically Ataru's best friend of sorts in the series. But in the anime, you got Mom well, Stormtroopers, which stick around way longer than they do in the manga. By the way, in a lot of situations, you're going to see Kosuke being replaced by Perm. They're pretty much the same character, even though technically they're not. It's confusing. Anyways, Megane and the rest of the Stormtroopers have a lot to do with the anime. You can kind of think of them as the production crew self-inserts in the way they treat them. They're pretty much the classical otaku. Megane always gets into these crazed rants about fascism and communism because he's just so eccentric. The guy is positively obsessed with Lum. I mean, his room is covered in posters of her and he even has a body pillow of her. So he's a real pioneer in that department. Now, of course, he's going to butt heads with Ataro because he thinks he treats Lum like crap. So you're going to see him constantly try to suck up to Lum and make Ataro look bad. The anime also uses Megane sometimes when the manga would use Mendo, such as in Pitter Patter Christmas Eve. So I could think of him as kind of a composite character in a lot of ways. By the way, he's an amateur film producer. There's actually two separate episodes plus a whole movie about making movies. And of course, they're all completely different. Some people may not like these characters because they're not accurate to the manga or whatever, but undeniably they make the series better. I mean, in a world as crazy as this, you know there's gotta be at least a few people who are just absolutely obsessed with these aliens. By the way, the other stormtroopers aren't as obsessed with Lama as Megane is. In fact, we occasionally see him try to go out with other girls, and I kind of wish they had a little more personality themselves, but they're always fun to have around. So I salute you, Megane Poster. Keep making that art. How can you not like Ran, is what I thought when watching a series, but as it turns out, a lot of people hate her. And while I get why you hate her on the surface, she's my favorite character, so I'm going to explain to you why Ran's the best. Ran and Lum were pretty close growing up. The thing about Ran though is she always had to deal with Lum's deceptive ways. Basically Ran had an abusive mother and Lum always liked to blame stuff on her, so Ran constantly got abused. Then Lum had the gall to actually take away Ran's crush, and then dumped him. You can see why she's the way she is. So Ran constantly resented Lum. Once she heard about what Lum was doing on Earth, she decided to pay a visit. Now something to know about Ran is that she's described as a member of the Oni races, which I guess means she's like related to an Oni, but she's definitely not a pure Oni. I mean she's got no horns and her hair is pink and fluffy. But anyways, Ran's here for revenge. Lum took away Ray, so Ran's gonna take away Darling. And in fact, Ran's the only other character in the series that calls Ataru a Darling. Now let's talk about some of Ran's traits. Her main ability is the fact that she can suck out people's youth through her lips. So she's got like succubus traits kinda. But her most defining characteristic is of course her split personality. Sometimes you find her as a very nice sweet person. Very traditionally effeminate. It's not only her mannerisms, it's the entire way she conducts her life. I mean just look at her house, it's delightfully retro. And when out in public she always dresses in these classical outfits. On the other hand, her rage gets to her and she can be vindictive to the max. She has a large personal arsenal and won't hesitate to use it. Of course, it's all justified. 
Because remember, Rand's only this way because of what Lum did to her all those years ago. Rand's got some other interesting traits too. She's actually a pretty adept businesswoman. And she's got her own mystical sources of power, though most of these are from strange space artifacts. Now, of course, I know there are some Rand fans out there. Some really committed ones. Just don't be like this, people. I'm here to call all you Rand haters. You know who you are. Rand's better than Lum, what can I say? By the way, look at the intro of the video again. Notice something? Anyways. Rand's got some excellent traits, including very good gardening skills, an excellent cook and baker, immaculate fashion sense, nice demeanor, and the hair. You can't forget the hair. By the way, remember how one was associated with gains? Rand's associated with losses. If you buy a lot of puts, then Rand's for you. She's heavily associated with socks, which is basically the opposite of Soxel. Often you'll find Lum posters and Rand posters going at it over stocks. Considering we're in a bear market right now, maybe it's a good time to invest in Rand. It's better than Bay Horse at least. By the way, unlike most characters in the series, Rand actually had two voice actors throughout it. For the first half of the series, when it was animated by Studio Perot, Yu Inoue was the voice actor for Rand and she was just immaculate. I mean, you gotta have incredible vocal range to go from this... ...to this. <laughs> However, she eventually decided to take a trip through Southeast Asia in 1983, so she was replaced by Kazue Komiya, who honestly did a pretty decent job, but it's just not the same. No disrespect to her, of course. <laughs> Ben Ten's a fun character, and by the way, that's her full name. It's not Ben Tennyson. She's actually based on one of the Chinese gods of luck, who, in her second appearance in the series, you can actually see the rest of her daughters. You can kind of think of her as alien equivalent to Yunosuke, though she was actually raised normally. Now her and Lum always had a playful rivalry because every year on Setsubun, the Oni and the Lucky Gods always participated in a contest of sorts, filling up the basket. It's weird, but it works. So they get along quite well. Benton's probably Lum's most loyal friend out of all of them because she doesn't screw around like Ran, and as we're going to see, Oyuki's got her own personality. By the way, unlike Lum, who's usually pretty nice to Ran, Ben 10 does not put up with her crap at all. Ben 10 and Ran have pretty comparable arsenals, actually, which is quite surprising. I mean, the only other characters I can see who come even close is Mendo just because of his resources. By the way, don't mess with her chain, it really upsets her. Also, her ride of choice, the air bike, perfect. So anyways, if you like action girls, Ben 10's probably one of the best. Oyuki is definitely one of the more subtle characters. Compared to all the other aliens in the series, Oyuki is actually from quite close since she's the Queen of Neptune. Somehow though, no one from Earth ever found that out before this all happened. The thing that makes Oyuki interesting is that she's so proper. And not even fake proper like Mendo, she's like this consistently. She's also one of the only characters that don't get over the top expressions. However, she does have strong emotions, they're just more subtle. Don't get on her bath side, because if she turns down the temperature, you're pretty much screwed. She's a very skilled businesswoman, probably more so than Ran even. And that comes from the fact that Neptune deals with a lot of other planets, so she has to be good at this. Oyuki's voice by Noriko O'Hara, he gives a really calm tone, really orderly. But anyways, if you want to chill, Oyuki's for you. Onsen <laughs> Mark, who by the way, the new translation in the manga erroneously calls Hot Spring Emblem, which is just the dumbest thing in the world. He's a teacher of class 2-4. 
The guy's pretty much a loser and lives alone. But it seems like he takes his work seriously enough, even if every day he gets pissed off at his students. I don't have a lot more to say about him, really. He doesn't serve a major role in most of the series. He's just kind of there to tell off the other students about what they're doing and they get beat up and all that. He's voiced by Michiro Ikemizu, who just gives an authoritative tone, as he should, but it's funny. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. Now I need a place to hide away. Oh, I believe in yesterday. That's pretty much the extent of the extended main cast. Those are characters who pretty much always appear. Now let's move on to some minor characters. They don't appear as much, but they're still worth mentioning. You got Ray, who's, well, just based. I mean, the guy is straight up the Giga Chat of the series. He's got, like, no brains, but it doesn't really matter because he looks good. I never really understood the whole tiger cow thing, but you know, I'll just roll with it. He's voiced by Tesla Ogenda, but you're not gonna hear his voice much, he barely speaks. You got the Bogotoy Q character, Kotatsu Neko. He's basically a big ghost cat who died, so now he just kinda chills around. You trio see him either at one of those Kotatsus, you know, the heated tables, or I'll just be chilling with Cherry. Honestly, he just does his own thing, and you gotta respect that in the series. You got Ryoko Endo, who's Chitaro's sister. Pretty much an evil mastermind who just likes to dick around with people. And instead of her servants being businessmen like Chitaro, they're Kuroko, which are basically just stagehands. If you want to talk about a true dark horse for the best girl, this is one of them. Just make sure she's not messing with you, because she will. By the way, she's voiced by Mami Koyama. Moving on, we got the brother and sister pair of the Mizuno Koji family. There's Toby Maro, who's a great baseball player. And by player, I mean eater. Like, he eats the balls. I mean, geez. He's got a big drive with Chitaro, and you might see him play baseball once in a while. And there's his sister, Asuka, who's really, really, really strong, and also maybe kind of mind broken. So, um, Onisama? Yeah. She's a fun character, but she doesn't appear very often, like her brother. Tobimaru is voiced by Bin Shimada, and Asuka is voiced by Sumu Shimamoto. Another minor character is Kurama, Princess of the Karatsu Tengu. Basically, there's no more guys on their planet, so she came to Earth with her crows. Of course, the crows got drunk when they were trying to look for a virtuous man and ended up picking Ataru. So she tried to reform him for a while. Didn't work. Tried to go for other guys and the girl. Didn't work. That's really about it. I mean, you only see her for a handful of times and she's always trying to find a mate. Also, she hates Oni. Just thought I'd mention that. Gotta say though, Choker, 10 out of 10. She was forced by Rihoko Yoshida. They got the principal of the high school, he just kind of, you know, does his own thing. Though he's really committed sometimes to his education. Pretty much nothing more to say about him, honestly. He's just kind of funny. There's the Spice Girls. Three middle school girls who just want to take down their senpais and emerge as the most legendary gang of this school. That being Wam, Oyuki, and Benten. So once in a while you'll see them pop up just to cause trouble. There's Tsubame, Sakura's fiance who studied magic in the west, so, you know, he's got a western flair to him. There's Nagisa, though I'm going to save him for the Rinosuke video since his story is tied into hers. And finally, the last set of characters I really have to mention are the parents of both Ataro and Lum. First of all, the Moroboshi family, who are constantly resenting the fact that they gave birth to Ataro. Mr. Moroboshi usually just reads his paper, but Mrs. Moroboshi is a more interesting. In fact, there's an entire episode dedicated to her. And I know at least one guy out there has her as his favorite girl, and you know what? All the power to you. And then Wum's family, a little more traditional. Mr. Invader is just the old warlord who just wants to invade planets, but he's a nice guy, though he's definitely less fit than he used to be. And Wum's mother cannot speak Japanese at all, so her dialogue is always shown as Mahjong titles. Sometimes you'll see Wum interact with them. They're good to have around, I feel like. There are other even more minor characters, but honestly, I think we've gone long enough as it is. Of course, I'm leaving out L and all the movie-centric characters, since when I cover the movies, that's when I'll be able to cover the characters. But as you can see, this series has a lot of characters. And they all get unique, varied personalities that work off each other brilliantly. I mean, when you see the next episode, it's gonna be a Ran episode, or a Yuki episode, or a Benton episode, you know it's gonna be good. And throughout the series, a lot of them do have some growth. Most of the time, you're gonna see characters soften up as they relax their personalities a bit. But space is always gonna be super weird, isn't it? Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this and got a better look at the characters of Ursa Yatsu. Next video, we're going to be covering how Ursa Yatsu left off the pages of Weekly Shonen Sunday, down to the screens of millions of Japanese families as it aired on Fuji TV every Wednesday night. 
We're going to see how an incredibly talented set of people were able to not only take the foundation of the manga and make it really great as a television series, but improve on it. If you ask most people, they'll say the anime is better than the manga. And while the manga was popular, it was the television series that made Urusei Yatsura a cultural phenomenon. Until then, take care. You can subscribe, like, do whatever, visit WAPCHAN if you want, it's a lot of fun. And see you then.